Hi. Well, I want to talk to you today about the group of philosophers that falls under the general rubric known as the Hellenistic philosophers and their theories about uh, aesthetics and the philosophy of art and whatnot in the spirit of this survey of the history of aesthetic theory that we're doing right now. It's funny, you know, in my other classes uh, here at Linfield, the traditional classes I'm teaching, I've been talking about Hellenistic philosophers all week, and I would have thought that would have given me quite a bit to say about this, but the funny thing is it's actually put me in the almost the opposite direction. I find my mind going in a lot of different ways as far as trying to think about how I would explain this stuff to you. I don't know, perhaps I'm just getting wrapped up in it too much. But as I've sort of put myself towards this to try to, to try to get some of this down for you, there is something that, that comes up, I suppose, as far as the Hellenistic philosophers generally, and it's this. Despite the variations in their cosmologies and in their ethical theories, um, and then from that, from their ideas of aesthetics, they do have a common theme as far as what they are aiming towards with philosophy in general, what they see the endeavor of philosophy as being. And that is that they see philosophy almost as a kind of therapy. It is, uh, it has very much in common with many of the Asian traditions this way, one of the reasons I'm so very fond of a lot of the Hellenistic thinkers. That is to say, they see philosophy and reflecting upon the nature of what is as a means of either transforming or perhaps a better word is acclimating oneself to the nature of things the way they are. Now this is really important as far as our discussion about theories of art go because one of the things that it's going to mean is that what makes a difference about art, indeed what art has to do with, isn't a question of expression. It isn't really even a question of understanding. What it is, is it's a question of harmony. It's a way art becomes a medium by which we bring the mind, the soul, the dimensions of ourselves in line with the nature of things, in line with that which allows the world to, uh, which, which we come to understand ourselves with. And um, in this regard, there's very much a sense that art succeeds or fails as art not if it's clear, and not really even if it leads to some kind of understanding, but if, but if there's some way in which it brings those dimensions of us that are in disharmony with the world into harmony with it. Now, like I said, this is done in a lot of different ways depending upon the philosophy you're dealing with. If you take the Epicureans, for instance, the central feature of Epicurean uh, philosophy really revolves around its ethics, the idea that what there is in the world is pleasure and pain and and uh, as far as what we can ascribe as having value and that to lead the happy life is basically to lead a life that is pleasant not not ridiculous not grasping after pleasures that can't be maintained but simple pleasures that most of all allow us to acclimate ourselves with the inevitability of death um, and be happy and easy in life this way well, the art that brings us to something like that, I don't know, I, perhaps a haiku poem. Uh, not that Epicurus would have known about this, but, but something of that nature. This would be great art. And the reason would, it would be great art is because it would be able to bring us to this point. You take the Stoics. Stoicism, on one hand, has a lot of differences from Epicureanism. It certainly downplays the emphasis on pleasure and pain. But it does have this same idea that happiness isn't really even so much emotion, it's more of a disposition, um, and specifically a disposition towards an easy flow with, with the, the, the way of the world, the, the ordering logos, the thing that keeps everything in line and is, is sort of what we might call fate today. The art that is able to help us control our emotions, control the sort of illusory swinging back and forth of the soul that gets us to chase after things that shouldn't, shouldn't be, uh, that aren't real and, and distract us. This, this is what would make great art for the Stoics. 
um, for the skeptics, the ones who see the mind as perpetually dancing from one question to another and to use reason to a point where it recognizes it can't apprehend any particular thing at all. This is something that where art would lead us to a point where we can achieve this state of unperturbedness of our mind, where we're not pushed by questions, what, what's referred to as ataraxia uh, in, the, in the writings. Um, this would be great art. In other words, great art, great, and the aim of art is to find some way to bring us in line with that which we struggle against in being what we are, right? A lot of different philosophies talking about it in different ways, but this is what, what it's trying to, to aim towards. And it actually brings up another, another dimension, too, something that uh, I've seen popping up now in the, in the threads that we've been talking about in the discussions, but I, I'd like to elaborate on just a little in the little time I have here. Um, it has to do with the role of beauty. There, this is going to be an issue that comes up really throughout this whole section of the course because art has a very peculiar relationship with beauty. It embraces the idea of beauty for much of its history and it projects it at other times, mostly more contemporary times, seeing it as shallow. But there is this great question of what exactly is beauty and what's beauty's relationship to art. And one of the things that we're going to see, and this will be especially the case with the Neoplatonists, who I'm going to talk about in the next lecture, uh, with the medieval thought and the Renaissance thought, one of the things that we see with beauty is beauty seems to reflect not just a matter of taste, not just a matter of feeling, but a sense of the rightness of things. When we say that something is beautiful, what we see is a kind of proportioning of it, a right organization of it. And you can see within the Hellenistic philosophers why that's important. Why is the right proportioning of a poem or a dance or a, or a painting, why is this important? It's important because it helps us bring ourselves in line with those things that we struggle. It helps us tame our passions. It helps us have a clearer sense of things. It helps us feel easy in the world and from that achieve a kind of happiness. Art is beautiful, but the beauty is, has, isn't important simply for its own sake. It's important for ethical reasons, in the sense that it helps us come to be what we are. And, even here's another word for you that you may not have come across before, for soteriological reasons. For reasons, soteriology has to do with the nature of salvation, liberation, spiritual freedom, if you like. Uh, so grace is a soteriological concept. Moksha in Brahmanical thoughts, a soteriological concept. Nirvana in Buddhism, soteriological concepts. These are all soteriological concepts. Well, beauty in art has a soteriological dimension in, in Hellenistic reflections upon it. And indeed, this might be its most important thing, most important quality. Art must be beautiful because art can, as the bumper stickers say, save. So this is something to think about. What, what do we mean by beauty? Is beauty really just a matter of taste, or does it reflect something about the nature of, of that which is expressed in art? How important is beauty to art? Because it seems like art fulfills its functions in the world and in our, in our lives by being beautiful in its own way, in its own measure. All right, so some things to reflect upon with regard to Hellenistic theories of art and aesthetics.